Good evening. Welcome to the lounge. We're broadcasting from the Equator Bar at La Palm Royal Beach Hotel in Accra. My name is Kweku Sechiado. In 2010, Ghana produced oil in commercial quantities for the very first time. It came from the Jubilee Fields in the Western region. You know, since 1896, many, many companies had sunk millions of dollars in exploration but found dry wells. Well, except, of course, for seawater. They left one after the other with nothing but sorry stories for investors. But in 2007, Cosmos, a U.S. company, got lucky with their exploration block. Very lucky. They found oil enough to produce 100,000 barrels a day. Cosmos had a Ghanaian partner, EO Group, who was, in fact, the initiator and driver of the project. EO Group's CEO is George E. Osu, a surprisingly modest and humble man. But George Osu's story comes with a bitter twist, because after 2009, he was fired by Cosmos and then pursued by the Ghanaian government for a raft of alleged crimes he swears were cooked against him. And once again, he triumphed, and he has survived to share his story. George Owusu joins me for drinks tonight on the lounge. And by the way, we have a bottle of crude oil from the first pour in 2007, right here on the lounge. Mr. Usu, and you published a book which recounts the, your life and the story of this find. And the title, In Pursuit of Jubilee, a true story of the first major oil discovery in Ghana. I read uh, a part of it. Excellent work. But let's start with this bottle on this table um, containing crude oil. Mm -hmm. I'm opening it. It's very greasy. It smells like petrol. That's right. So tell me about this here. Thank you, Kweku, for giving me the chance to appear on your show. It's and my honor and privilege. Thank you. And also to tell the nation about what we have here. What we have in this can is the first oil, the first sample of oil out of the Jubilee field. This came out on the first day that the oil was discovered. And, it's and that was in 2000, and where well, you started exploration in 2003, correct? That's right, earlier than that. And the discovery was made in June 2007. Right. And uh, the, form, the president at that time, uh, President, president Kufour. Kufour, asked us to bring him the first sample. So he flew to the field and collected the sample right in the same can. And this is the same. Right in the same bottle. That's right. And that's the bottle that I poured for the president at the time that he announced to the nation that country Ghana has finally found oil. And the account was derided. Mm -hmm. um, you were laughed at. Mm -hmm. um, the contents of this bottle was scoffed at. Yes. But here we are. That is it. The real thing. So how did you, where were you when... Uh, you received, was it a phone call? Was it a text message to tell you we found it? Okay. Um, that was on the night, on, it was a Tuesday. At that time, I live at the Golden Tulip. You know, the hotel, they have some chalets. Uh, most of the big hotels we see in the country were not, in the crowd were not there at the time. So I had to rent about 30 rooms and keep them for some of the people who will be coming from overseas to come and work in the field. 
So around 2.30 a.m., I received a phone call from Thomas Manu. Thomas was the operations manager at GMPC. And he told me, I didn't be able. So what do you, what do you say? I'm starting to Of course, he himself, he wasn't sure. But keep quiet. I immediately got up, put on some blue jeans, and I, I just could not contain myself. It was too dead in the night, around 2 a.m. I went to the Golden Tulip, around at the back of the Golden Tulip, where the pool is. There's a big park. I was just walking around there by myself. I didn't even know what to say, what to think. I jumped, laughed. I mean, it, it was just so, such an exciting moment in my life that I just, it was, you need to be there. But I was told not to say anything about it, so I kept my mouth shut for a week. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever done. <laughs> I knew something nobody in the country knew, but I was supposed to keep it quiet. And so that's how I felt. I felt I was on cloud nine at that time. And um, subsequently you broke the news, yes. as opposed to the president, President yes. Kufu at the time. Yes. How did he react? Oh, the man was jump, dancing in his living room. I mean, you can see some, there were some other old men, older men. One military officer, I think his name was Hamidu. He has this big northern smoke. The man was turning ah. around like this, like a flare, you know. It, it was an, some exciting Must be moment. Just Joshua Hamidu. That's right, Joshua Hamidu, that's him. And I, it was a good feeling and it's very good to be a part of something big for the country. And I was in it. And I thank God that he gave me the time, chance, the opportunity to be part of such a historic moment for the country. So, I mean, a lot of companies have, ha, have done exploration yes. since the 19th century, late mm -hmm. 19th century, mm -hmm. um, and barely found anything. Yes. With the exception of a little bit of the salt pond uh, uh, shores, mm -hmm. but nothing in these conditions. Of course, compared to what the likes of Saudi Arabia and Nigeria and others produce, you know, there's not a whole lot. But when you look at the revenues that um, are supposed to come out of it, it makes a huge difference with the budget. Sure, sure, it was. Uh, yes, uh, Ghana, our oil is about just about 5% of what Nigeria produces. So when I hear people jumping up and down, it's going to be the hub of oil in West Africa, I just laugh. We just have one fail, one. Well, we just have a, another one, the Ten Project and also the Sankofa. But at that time, it was the only one. And so there was, it was good because we never had anything like that yet before, but it doesn't come anywhere near what Nigeria or Angola or Equatorial Guinea or Saudi Arabia produces. But it's good enough for us. But it's opened the doors, haven't it, has, hasn't it, for, oh, of course. for and given confidence to other investors to look harder and harder and to pump more money. Yes. Uh, before the discovery, as you might have heard, Ghana was called uh, <laughs> the graveyard for oil companies because <laughs> anybody who came here, all the people who came there lost money. And so it was a greenfield. And sometimes, maybe two or three years, they drill one well. But after the discovery, we de-risk the country. And be, after we were, we were able to de-risk it, so many country, companies started rushing in. And that's why we were able to get a 10 project going, the Sankofa project also going. And there have been several discoveries since then. Because it, gave, it told people, yes, the basin has large quantities of oil. Uh, right. Prospect for oil. Yeah. I mean, really, it would be surprising, wouldn't it, that, you know, you've got Ni Nigeria, you've got Ivory Coast, mm -hmm. you know, they have oil, and then somehow or the other, God skipped Ghana? Well, that was the motivation. We knew there was some in the Ni Ivory Coast, some in even Gabon, yeah. some in Nigeria. Why, why not us? Even Sierra Leone, That's Liberia, right. the good prospects. That's right. Why not us? So we always had a hunch that there was an oil in Ghana, but nobody could pinpoint exactly where until Cosmos came along. Now, let me tell you something about Cosmos. They are one of the best oil founders in the world. They are the ones who put Equatorial Guinea on the map. 
they are good in exploration, they don't do production. And so we were able to bring one of the best oil founders in the, in the world to Ghana. So they come, they find. And then they give it off to somebody else. They sell it off and walk away. Right. And, and go look for the next that's block. Right. And that is why they wanted to give it to Exxon. But you know the story, what happened. They, uh, the government did not allow them to come in. And so Talo uh, became the operator. And the, in fact, Talo was the operator first, so they continued to operate. How did you get here? How did you, how did it start? Well, that's a long True, story. You were working with Shell. Yes. But did you have it in mind at any point that, you know, you'd go to Ghana and go look for oil? No, not exactly. Um, I mean, I, I live in the United States. I live in Houston, Texas. I've been in the United States since 1980. Uh, I, I, I forgot when I went. It's over 40 years. Uh, I, I've did so many things. I've been, I spent about 25 years in the petrochemical industry. Until in 2000, year 2000, when former President Kufo was running for office, he came to Houston. And um, he inspired us. He said, look, you guys live here. You live in the petrochemical capital of the world. Why don't you do something to help our country? That's the first time somebody from outside the United States, a Ghanaian, implanted that idea in our heads. Did you know him before then? I didn't. I never knew who the, who the guy was. I knew of him. Right. Just but like you never met him. I never met him. I didn't know who he was until he came. But of course, I knew of him from right. outside. From afar. From afar. Okay, so then after he became president, he sent Mr. Kuf Mr. Kandapa, who was then the energy minister, to Ga to. Houston to find investors for Ghana. And because I work in the industry, I was asked to help. Now you're asking me about how the oil discovery right. started. I was asked to help. Of course I did. And after organizing this conference, Mr. Dapai came, spoke to these investors, and one of them decided to come to Ghana. And the company who, at that time who decided to come to Ghana was a company called Vanco, Vanco Oil. So I brought three oil companies to Ghana. The first one was Vanco. So I asked Mr. Uh, through the effort of Mr. Dapa, we were able to bring our first exploration company to Ghana at that time. And of course, uh, uh, the man at that time promised me he was going to make me the country manager, but later on when he got his block, of course, he kicked me out and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Usu, you work for Shell, and if I bring you to Ghana, I may be in trouble. And because of that, he went and found somebody else. And then after that, I went in and brought a sec second company. Did they find anything? No. Okay. Um, they sold off to a, a Russian company, and I think they even abandoned the block. But then I joined another company called NX. He's actually, it was through those guys that I first became exposed to oil exploration. Then we, the second company was called NX. NX came, uh, the present West Cape Three Points block, where the oil was discovered, was not picked by Cosmos. It was this company called Ennis. They are the ones who actually picked that block. We formed an MOU with the government, signed by everybody, and asked me to take it to this man in Houston for him to sign his blocks, his portion. At that time, oil prices have dropped to about $25, and because of that, he didn't want to do it. And so he left it. And when he left it, I was left with a MOU signed by everybody except a partner, and I didn't have any partner. So at one point, the whole West Cape, West Cape Three Points block was mine. <laughs> Except that I didn't have the money or the technical know-how to do anything with it. And of course, except you didn't know what was down there. Nobody did. Right. If, if anybody did, uh, uh, knew what was down there. Uh, you wouldn't have come to find exactly. it. Exactly. GMPC has been up in, uh, in the system for so many years, done so many things out there, but uh, they were not successful. But um, they couldn't find it. Um, what, what was I talking about? I, I, lost, I lost track of what yeah, I was so saying. Yeah, so the, the, the entire Cape 3, point, Cape three point, point block, block one point basically belonged to, belonged to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I went back to Houston. And so I threw this agreement, MOU, in my drawer. Because I was very disappointed with the man who refused to sign. 
So one day I said, oh, let me do something with this. So I took it to my company. That's where I work, Shell. Hey, this is what I got. Uh, petroleum agreement for a certain portion of Ghana's coastline. Will you be interested? Where? Ghana. Ghana? No, 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 Ghana. Where is it? So it's very close to Nigeria. Oh, okay, George. Uh, if you get a block in Nigeria, call us. But Ghana, dear, you don't know what you want. Okay, so that was my first disappointment. Then I said, okay, let me find out. So I went to Exxon, kick me out. Hess, out. I went to about 12 companies in Houston. There's a street called Louisiana Street. That's where most of the oil companies are. And that's where, because I used to work for Shell, we were also on the same street. One company out together, and nobody wanted to come to Door to door. Yes. No doors open. Exactly. Because of our history, because all the people who came in lost money. Graveyard. Exactly. And so that was the reason we found it very, very difficult to attract investors to Ghana. Until somebody told me about a gentleman who lived in Dallas called Musselman. I told this, anytime I tell this story about this, how I found Musselman and how I found Cosmos, people just laugh. It's okay. These people went to Kutura Guinea and found the oil there. But so, so Mosman was CEO of uh, uh, the company of, called Triton. Right. Triton found the, uh, the made a discovery in the Kutura Guinea, mm-hmm. and they were absorbed by another company called Hess. So they worked for Hess for two years, and after those two years, they, some of them got back and formed a new company. At that time, I didn't even know the name of the company. All I knew was Mosman. So the question is that I live in Houston, and this Mosman was in Dallas. So I said, okay, what is his phone number? I don't know. Okay, what is his first name? I don't know. These are questions you were asking the person the who person, was telling you about this Muslim man. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Does he have an e- email address? I don't know. Okay, what's the company's name? I don't know either. All I know is Muslim man. If you find him, maybe he might be able to help you. Just like asking me to go to Kumasi. When you go there, there's a man called Kum- Kofi. If you see Kofi in Kumasi, Kofi will help you. How do, how do you do that? And it wasn't, this was 2002, 2003. Internet was not as... Right, that was before true call. Exactly. So how do you do it? So what I did was, I called the telephone company in Dallas and said, give me the names of every Muslim man in the phone book. So I collected the names, and one night after work, I started calling, co-calling every Muslim man whose name was... Every Muslim man in the world, in Dallas. In Dallas. So I called Kwaku Mazuman, Kwame Mazuman, John Mazuman, <laughs> called and called and called. All the way to Z. Thank you. Until finally, I ran about 10 something the night. A lady picked up the phone. Oh, that's my dad. Okay, can I talk to him? So the, the father came and we spoke. And said, so, okay, why don't you take this number down and call somebody the next day? Okay, I called that person and they agreed. And that's how we were able to get Cosmos together. The company then became cost. So then you went to meet him, and then I went. I met him. I gave him. So you don't get petroleum agreement that way, right. because he, he didn't trust me at that time. Why should he? I mean, you know, that's right. Somebody who's calling, who called me cold in the middle of the night. Exactly. So I had to convince him. So I, first of all, I gave him my business card from Shell. I said, look, I'm in the industry. I'm in the business. So I'm not. He thought I was one of those four one nine yeah, scammers. Thank you. And fortunately, during that week, Association of Petroleum Engineers were having a conference in Dallas. And some of the GMPC guys were there. So I said, hey, let's talk to this guy. So I left the room, talked to him and find out. And when he found out, I knew those guys from GMPC. uh, He he started, you know, becoming a little bit more comfortable with me. And that's how finally, it's okay, we need to go to Ghana so that I can verify what you're telling me. And I brought them to Ghana January 12, 2004. And that's how, when the whole thing started. So he then decided to invest? Yes. They, they decided to do it. And then I asked them for uh, a portion of the, of the deal. Uh, there's one thing that I left out of the, my first narration the, the first company I came with, the one who, who prepared this MOU with me, they gave us 15% of the, of the block. And so, of course, I asked customers to give me 15%. They said no. 
One five. One five. How about ten? No. Five? No. We, only, we can only give you three and a half. That's so, well. Nobody wants to join me. And this thing was, to me, it was almost a waste. So if somebody is saying it's going to give you three and a half, hey, what do you do? You agree. And that's how we got three and a half uh, percent of what they have, what Cosmos had. Their share, mm -hmm. nothing to do with Ghana government. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to emphasize that. People have made so many uh, uh, noise about how come the government of Ghana get 10% and you alone get 3.5%. Sir, I want to tell the world, I want to tell Ghanaians, I want to tell everybody who's prepared to listen that my, our 3.5% did not come out of Ghana government share. It came from Cosmos' share. So those radio commentators and people who sit on radio and always say, yes sir, master, 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 please, I'm telling you, the story is, the truth is, Ghana government did not lose one iota of whatever was due them. Whatever I got was from Cosmos because I brought this deal to them. And for my compensation for doing that, that's how they offered us 3.5%. You're watching The Lounge. We're taking a quick break. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. My guest is George Yao Osu, CEO of EO Group, partner of Cosmos, founder of Ghana's first commercial quantities of oil. So tell me about EO Group. So then you established a company, you and your friend, uh, Dr. Edus Kwesi Edus. Kwambe Wedusa. Kwambe Wedusa was a physician in, in Washington, D.C. He was my friend. We formed the company in 2002. It was not about oil at all. We were just going to see if we can do some business here in Ghana. And because the previous company kicked me out, because I didn't go in there with any agreement, with any contract, with any company, it was easy for them to kick me out. So when I went with Cosmo, I said, look, this time I'm going to bring my uh, company. And we have formed this EO group, E, standing for Edusa and O, Owusu. That's how the whole thing was. Mm -hmm. So I just took this company and said, oh, look, this time, we're also going to be partners. And so the petroleum agreement was signed with Cosmos Energy, EO Group, and GMPC. Okay, so we were the people, the companies, who actually formed the group that made the discovery. And GMPC had 10%. Well, yes. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this 10%. When you look at all the petroleum agreements which, be, which were signed before we even came along, almost all of them have Ghana government getting 10%. So our, uh, but the 10% that you saw in our agreement, it's not unique to Cosmos. Telos agreement had 10%. Hess, 10%. Almost every one of them, 10%. But it is not only the 10% that the government gets. Government also gets 5% royalty. Royalty is, let's say, the first, this is a whole, let's say there's a bar of oil. Mm -hmm. The first 5% of this oil belongs to Ghana government for free. And then they get additional 10%, making 15. Ghana government also had a chance to come in and buy about 3.5% more, okay, without investing a penny, except the 3.5% that they were going to buy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, of course, there is a corporate tax of about 35% which also government gets. There's also something called surface rental. Surface rental is the area that they are operating. The operating area belongs to Ghana government. Just like you lease somebody's land to purpose for gold. Hey, and the landowner may come and say, okay, for you to sell my land every year, pay me rent for this. That's what they call surface rental. And then there's a, a fourth one called additional oil entitlements. In other words, if your internal rate of return goes over a certain limit, the government of Ghana gets some more money. So in total, Ghana government share is not 10%. It's about 55%. 50 to 55 And these are not my numbers. These are numbers from Petroleum Commission and GMPC. So please, I would like the nation to know, people who care to know, people who want to know the truth, 
People want to know the facts. Go to GMPC, go to Petroleum Commission, and ask them the total, total amount Ghana government gets out of this oil. Okay. And I'll tell you, you something. You've got the, and you've got the numbers in, in, in yes, the book. Yes, I put it in my book. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. that's the reason, because I want people, that's one reason why I wrote the book. Because a lot have been said about two people getting 3.5% while the whole country gets 10%, because people didn't know the facts. They didn't know the story. They knew what so-called experts who sat on TV and told basic lies. You said there's one more thing that you wanted to say? Oh, about, about the, the 5%. Okay, so basically that's what uh, Ghana government got. It's not five. It's not ten percent. It's about 50, 40, 50 to fifty-five percent. So I want people to know that. So, um, so you must be very wealthy. Well, I happen to be at the right place at the right time. I didn't set out to be wealthy. I just happened to be there. It could have happened to anybody. I, I was just a simple, common bureaucrat like anybody else who go to the United States to work. What were you doing in, um, in Shell? Well, I was a commodity manager. I was what does that mean? Okay, I was in charge of contracts. Um, my background is environmental science, anyway. And so that's what I did. And anybody who wanted to uh, do business with Shell and the environmental side, most of the contracts came through me and how to make sure that uh, all the T's were crossed and I's were dotted and things were done right. On the environmental um, assessment exactly. and the impact, environmental yes. impact assessment yes. and so on. That's, and that's what I did right. for sure until I was asked to help Kandapa and mm -hmm. one thing led to another. So let's all of course you, you quit Shell. Yes. Uh, when Cosmos decided to come to the country, they asked me to quit my job to come in and run the operations which I did. At that time, they were paying me only $3,000 a month, even though I was making a six-figure salary in the United States. I had to quit, I had to sacrifice and come in because nobody knew whether we were going to find oil there or not. Right. And it was a risky endeavor for, even for Shell themselves. And because of that, they were not going to throw money around. And so a risky said, endeavor for Cosmos. Uh, Cosmos, yes, because mm -hmm. uh, they borrowed about $300 million from a private equity firm to come and process for oil. One more thing I need to let you so, know. And, and that could just disappear to the bottom of the ocean. That's right. In oil, oil and gas exploration, if you are lucky, the, the worldwide average, industry averages, if you drill 10 wells, you have a chance, maybe one and one and a half percent chance of success. In other words, in this business, about, you have a 90 to 85 to 90 percent chance of failure. Because of that, no bank will give you money to go and explore for explore for oil, do oil exploration. Private equity firms do that. So your chances are about one out of 10. One, one, out of one ten. and a half That's right. out of 10. Right, mm -hmm. and for me to quit my job to come to Ghana, I was running the same risk. One out of 10 chance of finding oil. So if oil had not been found in Ghana, after I lost my job in Shell, and uh, things have been very, very bad. What bad did your family me. say? What did your wife oh, say of when course. you decided to come chase oil? She, uh, when you were, when you were, you know, fairly um, comfortable in your life. Well, my wife thought I was, I was crazy. She didn't know. She didn't believe me uh, because you had a, had a very comfortable life, vehicles, big home, everything. But then all of a sudden, I come home and say, look, I'm going to Ghana to look for oil. Did she think you were coming to chase something else? Other oh, than oh oil? of course. Women always go think that way. That they, they always think. So Tell the whole truth. But of course, I had to convince her that that, 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 that was not the reason. Yeah? But he was very, very skeptical. Now, we're not compared to Ghana. Okay? And women would do that. And, so, and, a lot of very, the time, and a lot of the time, women tend to be right. Oh, yeah. Except on I mean, this very, occasion. Yeah. A lovely lady, though. She what? was the pillar in my house, you know, household. So. What, what gave you such conviction considering uh, the numbers okay i don't want to call it conviction i think um the good god lord up there was the one pushing me telling me to do it 
because I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a crystal ball to see what is out there, especially when so many companies with all the technical people have come in here and lost money. Who am I? We from here? Or here the band by the We say in free How do I do this? But when God says it's going to happen, it happens. And I, I give all the thanks and glory to God. So great story so far. Yes, sir. Um, so after that, happy times, I suppose. You know, hallelujahs everywhere. Um, all your dreams. What did you go and buy? What, tell me the first, check, the first large check you received from, from this. Oh, I can't talk about that. My wife will kill me. Because, <laughs> no, I can't. Those, that's one, one, thing, one place I don't want to go. Okay. But right. uh, what do you, do you do? I mean, you get up one day and all of a sudden, boom. Where do you start? Was there, was there something you desperately had all along as a young man dreamed of getting for yourself that you said, I'm going to get this? Well, I was an old man when this thing happened. You and your, like, early 50s, you're not? Yeah, I mean, right. uh, I'm... Uh, you are, like, 68, 68? Yeah, I'm 68 right, right. now. I'm yeah. almost 69. Okay. So at that so time... So this is, like, 15 years? Yeah. Well, 10 years ago. Yeah. All right, 59. 10 years ago. Okay. Uh, so I was well-grounded, mm -hmm. and I'm glad it happened at that time. If it happened when I was 23, I might have gone and bought a Lamborghini and maybe ran off somewhere and killed myself. Right. But I was 59, so I was grounded. I was stable, so... I made sure things were done right. Yeah, the first thing I did was I bought my wife whatever she wanted. Joe Pibia Kana I did that. And so she was there when things were rough, when things were bad. When they were paying me only $3,000, she had to go to work and take care of the household. Right. When, I, when I received the $3,000, I was sent 2000 to her in Houston to pay the mortgage and household, you know, take care of electricity and things like that. So, so I live on one thousand right. dollars at a time when nobody knew, and I didn't know we were going to find anything. Right. It was a risk we took. Right. Thank God it paid off, and so that's what happened. There's a question from um, uh, Kofi Annobwedi. He says, "I would like to find out from from him how he felt when the Atamils government persecuted him." after leading Ghana to discover oil in commercial quantities after years of searching. So I'll come to that in just a minute. Uh, let me see. I think I've got a couple here as well. Um, so this is from Jaden uh, in London. Okay. It says, very revealing to hear from Mr. Usu. Where has he been? Does he still have a deal with Cosmos? No, no, I don't. Okay, because? Because I have to sell my share to Tala Oil. And of course, Cosmos fired me because they were told to fire me. Okay. So, the, the, so that's the, part of the story you're yes. about to tell. Right. Um, Akusia Boating in East Ligon says, please ask your guest if the discovery of our oil is a blessing or a curse. Are we benefiting enough? Oh, it, is, it has always been a ble blessing. I can never ever say it was it's a curse. If you, even if you will receive one penny, one penny from this oil field, it is a blessing. It, it, has, it, it has so far, we've done very well in managing the oil, managing the resources coming from our oil so far. Now we have S, S, what do you call it? SHS, this free high school, and the president just said some of the revenue coming from oil. You know how proud, how happy I felt when I heard him say that. So, maybe, hey, I've been able to make some significant contribution to the children of Ghana. And so, I was very happy to hear the president say that. So Jay Bose's question, Jay Bose sent this question from Abbas. He says, did you say he, uh, he, he's published a book with all this information? How do we get copies? Yes, Jay, uh, there's a book, In Pursuit of Jubilee, uh, written by George Yaosu with uh, Ratledge McCall, uh, who wrote it with him, uh, the true story of the first major oil discovery in Ghana. Um, available in... Kingdom many, Books mm -hmm. and Holiday Inn in Accra. And the University of Science and Technology in Kumasi. Kumasi. All right. So you are in Obuasi. Um, you should be able to get a copy in uh, And perhaps online as well? Uh, not yet. Not I'm yet. going to put it online in the next two months. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to sell the real books first before I put it on. Excellent. Right. So, but there's a better 
twist to the story. Yes. After 2009. Yes. What happened? Well, what did you Where did you go wrong? Well, okay, when the new government came in, of course, you know, Ghana, rumors, people saying things which they cannot substantiate. So somehow, people say that, hey, I was just a front for the discovery, and the oil belong, really belongs to the former president, John Ajikum Kufu. The irony in this whole thing is, and that Kufu gave this block to me. What I always ask people is, Mr. Kufu is not a geologist. He's not a geophysicist. The man is a lawyer. Ghana's coastline, from half a city to a flower, how would Kufu know where to give me for me to find the oil? Especially in a place where for 100 years, several companies have tried and failed. How would Kufu know where to give me? These are just stories. People just spring around for political reasons. And somehow, a lot of people believe it. And maybe feel so sad and sometimes very angry to hear that. And it's the result of the outcome of those stories was what? Uh, because of that, there was an investigation. I was interrogated by the CID and the BNI here in Ghana about 13 times. One day, they called me to the CID headquarters. I was sick, I had blood pressure. Uh, I have gone to my lawyer, I give him a note from a doctor to t telling the CID guys to hold off for a few, more, a few, few days because I was getting sick. And uh, whilst I was handing the note to my lawyer, the phone call came in from CID headquarters, said you need to bring Judge Owusu to CID headquarters. Okay. I went there, they put us in a room for maybe about an hour, them not knowing they were gathering up policemen. I went downstairs, two policemen sat in my car, then another car behind us, about four policemen in it. Then a bus with about 40 to 50 policemen, some with guns, guns. And the dispatch rider, paper, 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 through the principal streets of Accra all the way to my office at Cosmos headquarters. And they went there, searched my books, took the hard drive of my computer, to search through it. Then the convoy went all the way to my house at Afenia. My wife didn't know what was happening. All of a sudden, police were all over the place. Such a house, a pure violation of my privacy. I couldn't complain. I yelled and screamed and said, look, what are you doing this for? Of course, they just brushed me off. Very, very humiliating. Did they find anything? Nothing. Well, they pick up a piece of papers or whatever and took them out. Your laptop? My laptop. They took the hard drive of my computer, just searched it to see if, if there was any communication between myself and President Kufu or anybody else. They were looking for incriminating evidence to, to support whatever information they received that this thing belongs to Kufu. Nothing. Then I received, a, there was, then there was a letter from Bank of Ghana instructing all financial institutions in the country to bring whatever information they had about me to them. Any banks that I had any transaction with. What they were looking for, they went through all this with a fine tube comb, looking to see if I've given any money to any government official. Nothing. And then finally, I was sent to the United States Justice Department, the FBI in the United States. Just because some people didn't believe it. Some people thought I have done something wrong. Some people thought I've, uh, I got this through some other means instead of the right way. That's it. I'll tell you. We went through the front door to get this. So the FBI also investigated? Oh, yeah. They interrogated me for about eight hours. Sir, and that's one thing I hope and pray you don't ever end up in the FBI headquarters. The building itself. It's so scary. 
and um, and your assets were frozen. My assets, your were bank accounts were yes. frozen. My assets, in fact, the, my assets were frozen, but for five years. So at one point, the, I lost my job because my, Cosmos fired you. Right, and my the little money that I had in my bank account was also frozen. So I had to depend on friends and family to support myself. That's so you used to drive around, go, move around in a, you know, stop a taxi and, but, and jump in. Well, I had a vehicle. At that time, I had, my, I had my own vehicle. But even to buy petrol for it was tough. And I had to live like that, borrow from friends and family to support myself until, uh, for almost 35 years, things were tough. Uh, at that time, I quit my job in the U.S. I was here, and I didn't have a job. <laughs> Those were bad days bad days, and uh, I don't wish this on any of my enemies. And one thing is, all they had to do was look at the process by which we obtained this block. First of all, you go to GMPC, because nobody was coming, GMPC themselves will give you a presentation of what they have. They will tell you, okay, we think there's all... I'm going to just jump in here and take okay. a quick break. Sure. When I come back, you tell us about you know, how you ended up with that particular sure. block okay. uh, from GNPC Good. or whoever. Good. You're watching The Lounge. We're taking a quick break. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. My guest is George Yao Osu, CEO of EO Group partner of Cosmos, finder of Ghana's first commercial quantities of oil. And of course, the a can of, this, of the crude oil uh, is here in a bottle right here with us in the studio. Um, you can hear it against the microphone. That's the first. Um, this is the bottle from which you poured the crude oil for President Kufuo yes. in front of cameras, yes. uh, but of course was derided as Ajongo. Yes. Um, this is the most expensive Ajongo, I suppose. Yes. So how did you get that block? Okay. That, I think that's a fair question, and that's one question I want to tell the country, and them to know how I did it. When the first company I brought, Vanco, kicked me out, one of their chief geologists, his name is John Craven. John Craven said, look, George, when we get to Amsterdam, let's talk. So we got to Amsterdam, and John Craven pulled, pulled me aside and said, look, George, it's easy to get a block here. Why don't you and I go get a block? I said, hey, me? I don't have two pennies to rub together. How do I get a block? He said, don't worry. I'll bring a company from Ireland. You go, okay. So he brought his company. The company was called NX. Okay. In, at GMPC at that time, because nobody was coming I mean, I shouldn't say nobody, few people were coming. When you go to GMPC, the first thing they do is they show you everything that they have. The, the technical people, the geologists and geophysicists have done a lot of work there. They say, okay, we think there's oil here, we may think there's oil here. Okay. So they show you whatever it is. And then you as an investor decide where you want to go. And so John Craven picked this area called the West Cape Three Points Block. One thing I also like people to know, GMPC does not pick a block for you. Because if they give you a block or an area and you go and drill and it's a dry hole, you may come back and sue GMPC and say, hey, you're the ones who told me to drill here and there's nothing here. So you go in, after they tell you whatever they have, you go in and pick the spot that you want. So John Craven picked the spot and the area was called West Cape Three Points. Okay. When you do that, the first thing you do is you tell them how you're going to do it. You meet, uh, they form a team, uh, negotiating team, made up of people from GMPC, Attorney General's Department, IRS, and uh, Auditor General's Department, and some lawyers. You, you can negotiate, depends upon how tough it gets, from as uh, maybe two months to as long as a year. I know Hess's negotiation took almost a year. Okay, after the negotiation, they take this uh, agreement and, and take it to the minister. The minister will look it over, and if it's okay with him, he will put a memo on it and send it to cabinet. So cabinet will look at it, and if they think 
the terms and conditions, so, okay, then they send it to Parliament. In Parliament, after the first reading, they refer to the Parliamentary Select Committee on Energy. At that time, it was made up of 10 uh, MPP MPs and 8 M NDC MPs. They are the ones who sat down and looked at this agreement page by page, line by line, word for word. And upon their recommendation, they recommend to the full parliament. They say, okay, we've looked at this, and we think this is good. They did that, brought the parliament, all those in favor, 100% no dissension. And in July, that's when we, 2000, I think, uh, two, that's when we get our agreement. And that was the process. We went through the front door. I keep saying that. And again, this is, at this point, you don't know what's beneath the earth. You have no idea. You have no idea. Let me tell you how, how you find it. Okay, look at this table. Okay, let's say this is the surface. Mm -hmm. You have your drill ship here. From here to here is just water. And you have to drill somewhere from here. Okay. How do you know? And the drill bit is just about this big. How do you know where? That's why so many companies come in, drill, and lose. It's not easy. Somehow, since your find, a lot more companies, uh, there's, there's been many more finds. Yes. Why is that? Is it, is it improvement in technology? That's, that has something to do with it. But the, with the major issue here is the more you drill, the more the chances that you find something. Because there was no fine, because there was no a success story, people didn't want to come and spend money in a place where there's no chance of finding oil. Right. And when Coastal Society to prove that, yes, there's oil there, people started rushing in and they were drilling everywhere. Anytime you drill, yes, you may lose some. And, and, and that's some. when, as you say, Ghana was de-risked. Exactly. That's why the company was de-risked. Now you've proven to the world that there's a chance of finding oil. So you were investigated, and in the end, what? In the end, they found nothing. They found nothing. After the humiliation, after I lost my job, after I almost died, the FBI wrote a letter, it's in a book, saying we've investigated this man, we don't see anything wrong. Two, three years later, the Attorney General's Department here in Ghana also wrote a letter to me, it's also in the book, saying that's not, we have found nothing wrong. Meanwhile, I've lost several chances, I lost my job, and if I have not been a prayerful person, when you are in crisis, when you are in crisis, you see Christ. Because I was in crisis at that time. I became closer to my God at that time. And uh, that's how I was able to survive. But thank God, I didn't know I had that tough skin to be able to withstand the assault that came to me. But God gave me some kind of power, some kind of strength to be able to withstand it. Those were bad days. Very, very bad days. But I'm happy that I'm sitting here with you today to tell you about the story, what happened. I could have been dead. Do you have any idea how these stories or where this, these stories originated? Huh. Do you think it was just rumor or just somebody just made it up? What? Well, I have rumors, but we don't want to go by rumors. But I, I hear some people told some people, people who didn't know, who didn't believe, who don't believe in themselves, thought, hey, who are you? How did you do this? Somebody might have cut corners for you. Somebody might have done something. And so they started these rumors and it became a groundswell of lies and innuendos. And so people believe it. And so people say, hey, let's investigate. Let's find out what, how this guy did this. And that's how I found myself in that predicament. And um, so then they, def they, they, they lifted the freeze on your assets and um, you got everything back. Well, I came about four, about four days away from losing everything. Four days. Because Cosmos at that time, my agreement with them was the first day that they put the first drop of oil in the tanker, I was on my own. I had to pay my cash calls. Okay, when I signed the agreement, hey, I thought when the oil is discovered, there'll be plenty of banks knocking on my door to give me loans to pay my cash calls. 
But because of the noise, because of all the things that were said about me, no bank wanted to touch me. Especially when customers attempt to sell to, uh, to uh, Exxon, fail. People thought, hey, if you touch these guys, who knows? The government it's toxic. We became toxic. You are 100% right. And because of that, we didn't have money. And they sent us default notices. And we came about four days, four days, losing everything until Talo came along and decided to buy it. And we, so we finally sold it to Talo Oil. So our three and a half percent was purchased by Talo. How do you spend your time these days? Well, um, I have a small private equity firm in Houston, Texas. That's where I live. I've lived there for about 44 years. Uh, I have a small office here in Accra. Um, I'm, I'm no, no longer in exploration, but I do a few things here and there. And uh, I've also built a hospital in the rural area in, around Kumasi area, at a place called Echankrum, uh, to take care of the rural folks, farmers. You know, I didn't, want to, I, don't, I didn't want to build a hospital to make money. Otherwise, I would have put it in Accra. That's where you make money. Mm -hmm. I put it in a small village to take care of rural folks. So those are the philanthropic work I'm doing. I form a, an, um, a foundation called George and Angelina Uso Foundation. I'll make sure I put my wife's name on it. Because she's, she's my partner, my friend, somebody who helped and supported me when I was down. And so I put her name, her name on it too. So that's what I'm doing. And I have about 20 acre land. I'm going to do more in the healthcare arena to help people. And uh, I've been blessed, so I want to share the blessings. Do you feel any bitterness towards um, those who um, were involved in uh, creating the problems that you faced post-2009? Well, bitterness doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, they have a saying that he who laughs last, laughs best. I'm not bitter at all. Maybe genuinely they, did, they, were, they thought there was something wrong. And they were doing their jobs. So I, I'm, I'm not going to feel bitter about them. But there's some people who were hiding behind the closet, pushing them, telling them what to do. Those are the things which was not so good. But uh, we are where we are. Things worked out for me. So uh, I'm not going to labor on that. See, I always want to look forward. This is a story my dad told me sometime when I was a young man. So when you sit in the car, there are two, you have a mirror and a windshield. The mirror makes you look back and the windshield will let you look forward. I want to always look at the windshield. That will take me to where I'm going. When you look back, you, are, you drive and look back, what will happen? You run into an accident. I don't look back, I look forward. And I'm not bitter at all. Because thank God, he was able to make things right set things straight for me. The truth finally came out and people really believe what my story. So that's why I documented it here for the sake of my children. I did it for my children so that they'll know that their dad is so the crook, your dad is so the thief, the dad did something good for the country. And I'm very proud, very, very proud that I've been able to do this. Look at the skyline of Accra, okay? Go to Takradi. At the time I was doing this, Takradi was a dying city. There was nothing there. Railways had collapsed, and the, the ports were not as vibrant as they are today. Things have changed. Look at the skyline of Accra. So many companies have come in here. So many com oil companies who never have come to this country are here. Look at the employment. You know, people who had gotten jobs because of the oil and gas exploration. So I'm not bitter at all. I b believe me, a lot of people would like to be in my shoes. So why should I be bitter when God has blessed me the way he has? Uh, no. So I'm, I'm content. Where did you grow up? Yes, I was born in Kumasi. I was born in Ashtown, Kumasi. I went to school there. I was a school teacher. I went to Swedish Secondary School in the Central Region. And I uh, went to Western College, trained as a teacher. And my father, I was also a petrol seller. My father owned about several petrol stations. So I, I guess maybe <laughs> petrol was in my blood. I was born in a business. Okay, when you go to, I'll show you where my father's petrol station is. If you, if you know Kumasi, yeah, right yeah, yeah. At, at the mortuary, Kumasi mortuary, Konfanochi Hospital, there's a shell station there, 1955, that was my father's shell station. 
the choir roundabout. That was my uncle's shell station. And right in front of our house, you know when we used to pump petrol mm-hmm. like that? There was a, a petrol tanker. Uh, there was one of those dispensers in front of my house. So maybe petrol flows in your veins. Uh, I hope not. It's not blood. <laughs> Yes, but you've been smelling the fuse for a long time. Yes, I have. Since you were a kid. Yes. So you sniffed your way down <laughs> to the bottom of the ocean. I wish I can say that. <laughs> it was a geologist and geophysicist. But before we, we close this, uh, I would like to say something that okay, I didn't do this all by myself. Okay, people at GMPC, we have some great guys there who done a lot of work. Okay, even though they didn't find it. We stood on their shoulders to do what we did. Okay, they did a whole lot of work, and the seismic work has been done. They acquired some seismic, and even those who failed, those who drilled and failed, right. we learned a lot of, from them because it told us where not to go. So I don't want to sit here and claim all the credit that I'm the or I'm the guy who did everything all by myself. No, there were tons and tons of people who tried and did so many things for the country. And we just maybe stood on their shoulder to get to the apple. But we need to also give thanks to them, those guys who were there when I was not around. If anyone wants to get into this business today, what, what do you say to them? Uh, more power to them. Oil prices are not good these days, but please follow your dreams. I didn't know I was going to be successful, so don't let anybody discourage you. If you have any aim, any aspiration, whatever you want to do, please go for it. But integrity, I always hammer on this, must be at the forefront. Don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. Do the right thing. Go through the front door. Do it right. Build your company, whatever you're doing, on solid rock. Don't build it on sand because, because you never know when the CID will come knocking. You never know when the BNI will come knocking. And if you build your company, your empire on, on sand, when the winds come, it will fall apart. So please, I know several people in the US who were the darlings of Wall Street, but they are now in jail because they didn't do it right. So my advice to young men and women here who wants to do anything, please, when you start right off the bat, make sure the foundation is built well. Otherwise, when you're up and everybody's singing your glory, that's when they find something very, very, very small. Hey, you know, remember you didn't do this? And the whole empire comes tumbling down. So that's my advice to young men and women. Because I could have fallen if they have found anything because they were there. They did it. They searched my house. They interrogated me for almost two years looking for things. And because we didn't do anything, I'm sitting here. Do you 25 see? charges. They proposed 25 charges. They couldn't take it to court because they're hollow. Go ahead. You still love Ghana? Excuse me? You still love Ghana? Oh, yes. Of course. It's my home. My mother's and father, my parents are still resting in the bosom of this country. My blood is here. That's what I can, I can live in the U.S. for 20 million years. I'm still an African. I'm still a Guinean. I'm still an Asante. I'm still from a child crew. That's where I'm from. I belong here. I don't, I don't care how many millions of dollars you have. It doesn't make a big difference. You are who you are. And I am from a child crew. I'm from Ghana. So that's how I feel about it. Thank you, Mr. George Owusu. Thank you, sir. For sharing your fantastic story with Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. My privilege. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. My name is Kweku Sechere. Have a good night. See you next week. Goodbye.